So this is going to round out our discussion of thermodynamics. We talked about entropy on Monday, and then we went over uh, the enthalpy and the heat of reaction. And we talked about spontaneity being driven by the entropy of the universe. So the system and the surroundings would increase the entropy of the universe. But we also saw some spontaneous reactions that were that went down in entropy. So it seemed like there might be more to the story. And the Gibbs energy is the thing that's the more, more to the story. It, it combines the enthalpy and the entropy to give us a gauge as to whether something will be spontaneous or not. So the big uh, topic today is spontaneity, and we use Gibbs energy as, as, a, as sort of a, a compass to know which direction the reaction is gonna go. So let's talk about spontaneous processes. We've, we've introduced this concept before, but spontaneous processes just happen just like a ball on a hill rolling downhill. Um, they, it occurs naturally at a given set of conditions without outside forces. Yes. As what? Yeah. So once you once you get them started, they just continue to go. And so those um, like fire or combustion is a great example. It's an exothermic process. It's also typically producing more gas because it's like in the case of a grass fire or wildfire, it's solid fuel that's decomposing, making gas, and then that's reacting with oxygen and making more gas. So that increases the entropy. So entropy is driving that forward and it's exothermic. So whenever you have both of those cases where there's an increase in entropy and it's exothermic, it's always spontaneous. Yeah. And, and so uh, it's the heat that's given off in, in combustion that causes, you know, we talked about in kinetics and activation energy. And if you can get the system over that activation energy, then the forward reaction happens faster. So whenever you have an exothermic process, all of the stuff around that reaction heats up and it makes it more likely to react. And so it's really the heat generated by fire that helps it progress. And so you need, you've heard of the fire triangle maybe? You need fuel, oxygen, but the third piece is heat. So if you can steal the heat, then you have fuel and oxygen, but if you can take the heat away, you get everything down below its activation energy and you can get the fire to not be uh, spontaneous, like it'll stop. Um, yeah. You can slow the reaction rate down to where it doesn't propagate. So that's one way we fight fires. We spray water on it and water steals a lot of the heat as it goes from uh, liquid to steam. And so that's, a, that's attacking the heat. Uh, whenever we um, spray like foam on a fire, that's, that sequesters the fuel and keeps the oxygen away. And so that's separating the oxygen and the fuel. So there's lots of different ways. Again, a spontaneous process of a combustion reaction can be stopped if you can take away the heat, which reduces it below the activation energy, or if you separate the reactants. Yeah. And so, yeah, so it's, right here is an example, hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen is the fuel. Oxygen is the oxidation or oxi oxidant or oxidizing agent. And it will react in what is the spark? What role is the spark playing? It's the activation energy. So once you get those reactants above their activation energy, then they can react spontaneously. So we have all three pieces of the fire triangle there, uh, fuel, oxidation or oxidant, and a spark. Most fires occur with just atmospheric oxygen, but if you were to put something in there that provides oxygen, like um, uh, like nitric acid or, or permanganate, something that is an oxidizing agent, then that's called an accelerant. And and you know, gaseous oxygen is only twenty percent of the atmosphere. But if I take um, uh, like permanganate solid uh, and put that in with the fuel, then I've got essentially a source, a solid source of oxygen, much more oxygen available. And typically fire inspectors, arson inspectors look for, um, in a forensic situation, they look for arson by looking for the accelerants. And so they see a lot of uh, manganese dioxide around an electrical plug. They're gonna say, hmm, something's fishy here. They're trying to make it look like an electrical fire, but they put an accelerant there to deliver a lot of oxygen and make the fire go faster. Now, if the reaction is spontaneous in one direction, 
If you reverse that, it will be non-spontaneous. So in the same condition. So if you have conditions where it's spontaneous in the forward direction, the reverse react, uh, direction will be non-spontaneous. So, so that's why I said that this spontaneity, this Gibbs energy is really like a compass. It's telling us if the forward or the reverse reaction is spontaneous. And so in this case, the uh, hydrogen reacting with oxygen to make water is spontaneous. And so then the reverse reaction would be non-spontaneous. Now, a non-spontaneous reaction is still possible, but remember, spontaneous means without outside intervention. So if we apply energy, we can get a non-spontaneous reaction to go. So we can essentially, it's like a, we talked about the ball on the hill, rolling downhill. How did the ball get up there? Well, you put energy into it. So if you take the ball up the hill, you're kind of running it backwards. Uh, chemically, we do the same thing. So we can produce hydrogen and oxygen from water with electricity. So we just put electrical voltage in, into, uh, into the water and it'll electrolyze the water and make the hydrogen and the oxygen. So we're running that, re that reaction backwards. Uh, you need to be a little careful with that if you do this um, because it's producing oxygen and hydrogen in the perfect ratio to make water again. And that's spontaneous. So if it gets near a spark, that'll happen and it'll explode. So um, this, um, in small amounts, you can do this and have some fun with it. You can put uh, a little bit of soap in water and a nine volt battery and you can see the bubbles grow and then you light them with a barbecue lighter and it'll pop, okay? Because you're making the hydrogen and oxygen go back to, to water. But again, that's a very dangerous thing to do in large quantities. <laughs> so, so. So I have to do the disclaimer, don't do that at home. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's also important not to confuse spontaneous with fast. So that's a really big um, conceptual thing. People think, oh, if it's spontaneous, it'll happen quickly. Uh, but the rate of reaction, the kinetics, they're not connected to the thermodynamics. So you can have a really spontaneous reaction be slow. So here's an example. The oxidation of iron is very spontaneous. I mean, that goes in the forward direction. Iron rusts. So you leave it outside and uh, it reacts with oxygen to make uh, iron three oxide. And this is a very slow reaction. Uh, it's dependent upon the surface area, though, because the oxygen has to have access to the surface. And so you can make, you know, if you have like an iron wrench, it's going to rust very slowly. But if you make iron wool or steel wool, think of the surface area that you have now. All the little pieces of iron are like the fibers of wool. And so you can take that and you can actually light it on fire. And so this is like homemade fireworks. Yeah, this guy has a uh, steel wool on a, on a wire, like a, a chain or, or a, a wire cable. And you can light it with, again, with the barbecue lighter and just spin it and it throws off sparks like that. So that's this reaction, but it's happening quickly because of the surface area. If you just set steel wool out on the bench, it's a really slow oxidation reaction. So again, the, the spontaneity doesn't have anything to do with the speed of the reaction. So it could be very, very slow. Here's an example. Diamond is actually uphill chemically from graphite. So how sad is that? You know, you get this beautiful diamond ring and uh, it actually would like to turn into graphite, which is, you know, pretty useless. I mean, we've got graphite right here. If I took all the graphite in this pencil and turned it into diamond, I would have a pretty good sized diamond, you know, but uh, that's uphill chemically. And so it's an immeasurably slow rate, even though it's spontaneous, it's immeasurably slow at moderate temperatures. If you were to put this up to a thousand to 2000 Kelvin range, uh, then you could get it to turn into graphite. So don't don't put your diamond ring in a fire, <laughs> okay? Because it might graphitize. Um, energy, just like uh, we talked about balls on the hill, energy flows downhill too. So hot to cold. Um, whenever you feel some cold surface, it feels like it's making you cold. It's making you cold by your heat getting sucked out. So you're feeling the heat transfer. Your nerves are telling you, oh, that surface is cold. But you're not detecting cold. You're detecting the loss of heat. 
So your little nerve endings are saying, wow, we're, we're getting heat, you know, flowing out of the body. And it's saying that I'm having a hard time keeping my hand at body temperature. And so that surface it's touching is cold. So that's what's going on there. So coldness is really a lack of heat. And that's what makes it so hard to get something down to absolute zero. Like how would we get it to zero Kelvin? We'd have to put it in contact with something colder. So if I have something at 100 C and I put it in contact with something at 50 C, I'm sucking out the heat from that thing. How would we get something down to zero Kelvin? We'd have to put it in contact with something at zero Kelvin. So it's, you know, you're, you're, it's a chicken and the egg thing. How do we get something at zero Kelvin so that we could get something down to zero Kelvin? There are some ways we get things down to nano Kelvin. Um, and, and so in all little clusters of gas, you have some really cold atoms or, or molecules. And so if you let the hot ones leave and you hold on to the cold ones, then you've got cold ones. So you could just, in the properties, like say you have a really fast molecule and it hits two other molecules and gives up all of its velocity, it's moving really slowly, it's really cold. So for gases, the velocity is temperature. And so we can, um, uh, we can let the hot ones leave if we can confine these things in a vacuum and we can get down to nano Kelvin. And maybe even, they've got maybe gone lower than that. Uh, we can calculate the, the reaction values for entropy. So entropy of reaction, enthalpy of reaction, we've done this in the past. Um, we had those enthalpies of formation tables. We have the standard entropy tables. We could do the same thing with this idea of Gibbs free energy, and it combines both of these. So how do entropy and enthalpy interact? Well, this is how, okay? So looking over here, free energy is this delta G term, okay? That's the Gibbs. Gibbs free energy. What do we mean by free? Well, the best description I've heard of that is that you have the, the enthalpy or the heat you get from a reaction minus the entropy tax. <laughs> so it's, it's what's left after you take away the entropy effect. Okay, and so if you have an exothermic reaction, it would produce a negative delta G, that'd be great. That would be a spontaneous reaction. Um, but if the entropy tax is so much that, that it wipes out all that heat, then you could have a positive delta G and you wouldn't have a spontaneous reaction. So up here, let's, let's, if we have an endothermic reaction, so delta H is greater than zero, and in this process, entropy goes down. Then those are non-spontaneous always. It requires energy to be put in and it becomes more ordered. And we know that, the, again, we say nature tends towards disorder. So this is going backwards in both cases. So that'd be a non-spontaneous reaction if it's endothermic and entropy goes down. Let's go down to the other, the very bottom one. This is exothermic. And entropy. goes up. So that's the case where it's always spontaneous. And that's what we were saying about combustion of typical fuels with oxygen. It's producing gases, so entropy is going up, and it's exothermic. So in that situation, we always have a spontaneous reaction. These are some interesting cases in the middle. So here, the, the, uh, it's endothermic. Okay, and entropy is going up. And you see now it's temperature dependent. So down here, increasing temperature. So the temperature effect on entropy, if entropy is greater than zero, then as we raise the temperature, this piece becomes more and more negative. 
And so the delta G is getting less and less and less. And when it crosses zero, then it becomes spontaneous. So we can overcome this endothermic reaction. If we increase the temperature enough, we can make it go spontaneous. Okay, and that's what we have for a lot of uh, solvent mixtures. So we mix these two molecules at low temperatures, they form two phases, so they don't mix. So the mixing is not spontaneous. But if we increase the temperature, a mixed solution, remember think of a jar of marbles or a jar of M&Ms, two colors, you know, if you mix them, they spontaneously mix, right? In, that's an entropy thing. But what if there was a little bit of an energy difference? Then by increasing the temperature, we're favoring the mixing. By decreasing the temperature, we're favoring the separation. And so that's what's going on when, when, this, when the, um, the mixing is endothermic, it would prefer not to be mixed. But if you raise the temperature, you're letting entropy drive it into the mixed state. So that's what we see with the, um, like they say, oil and water don't mix. Well, what temperature? They do mix at high enough temperature, but at low temperatures, oil and water don't mix. So again, these kinds of mixing things can be temperature dependent, and this is why. It's because there's an increase in entropy, but it's endothermic. And so that's, that's the situation where you raise the temperature and you can get it to go spontaneous. The opposite is also true. So this is a, an exothermic reaction, but entropy goes down. Uh, Let's see, entropy goes, entropy goes down. Okay. And so in this case, because entropy is less than zero, it's negative. And so it cancels this positive sign, or this negative sign and makes it positive. So, um, so the only way to get that to be uh, non-spontaneous would be to raise the temperature where this, um, Entropy is not favoring mixing in this case, and so you raise the temperature and the entropic effect keeps it from going together. So this, what I just said, is all up here in this text. So you can see the process is spontaneous at high temperature. Here this process is spontaneous at low temperature. And then the green one, it's spontaneous at any temperature, and here it's non-spontaneous at any temperature. So these are the four possibilities we have. And it's just this balance between the entropy piece and the enthalpy piece. So the sign of delta G indicates if a reaction will be spontaneous or not. So if delta G is less than zero, that means it's negative. The reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction. If delta G is greater than zero, it's positive, then the reaction is non-spontaneous in the forward direction. So we're talking about how the reaction's written. If you look at the reaction as it's written and you calculate the delta G, if it's positive, then the way you've written it is non-spontaneous. If you flip it the other way, then it, you'll flip the sign on delta G and it'll become spontaneous. Does spontaneity apply Yeah, we're gonna get there, yeah. It's going to be so cool. <laughs> and then when delta G is zero, then you're at equilibrium. And so then we'll be able to figure out what the equilibrium constant is from this. So that's going to be really cool. Oh, so make sure you got those. So there's three possibilities. Delta G could equal zero, which means you're at equilibrium, or it could be greater than zero, or it could be less than zero. And it's telling you which one, which direction is spontaneous. And so to calculate the temperature at which the spontaneity of the reaction changes from, from spontaneous to non-spontaneous or back, vice versa, you could find the temperature at which delta G is equal to zero. So if you have this situation where you've got, say, an endothermic reaction with the entropy um, uh, decreasing, then you could just solve for that temperature, just algebraically. And then that would tell you the temperature at which it becomes spontaneous. We use this to calculate the temperature of mixing. So if we knew the delta G of mixing for, or the enthalpy of mixing of oil and the entropy of mixing for oil, we could calculate the temperature which becomes one solution. And that would be the uh, upper critical solution temperature. So this is the temperature at which delta G becomes zero. And by definition, the system will be at equilibrium, okay, as it's written. Yeah. 
So then let's talk about the entropy of phase changes. So phase changes occur at their respective equilibrium temperatures. And so for water, melting and freezing is at equilibrium at 273.15 Kelvin at one atmosphere. And boiling and condensation at one atmosphere is 373.15. And so we could use this Gibbs energy <laughs> equation to solve for the entropy of those transitions. So the entropy change for boiling water is going to be that delta H of vaporization over the boiling point. So see what we did? We just solved for entropy. So, um, yeah, delta S is going to equal the delta H over the T. And so this would be the entropy change for boiling water. It's a positive amount because you're going from a liquid to a gas at 150 joules per mole Kelvin. I want to point out that that the entropies are typically written in joules because they're about you know one thousandth of the magnitude of the enthalpy. So the enthalpies and the Gibbs energies are in kilojoules typically. So I'm emphasizing the kilo, and then here it's just no no kilo. because a lot of times people will um, mess that up in terms of the units. Just like we have the standard enthalpy of formations, uh, we have also the standard free energy of formation. So the same reference state applies for the delta Gs. So uh, the formation of one mole of a substance from its elements in their standard states at one bar and 25C, um, the elements are zero for those. And so then uh, here's the delta G of formation for water because the formation of H2 and the formation of O2 is zero. So this would be our delta G of formation of water and delta G of formation is zero for the elements in their reference states. So we could calculate the delta G of reaction just by taking products minus reactants. Okay, so last slide, so you said yeah, so yeah, that, that's all it is. So if you just convert from, from kilojoules to joules, you'll be dividing by a thousand. No, you'll be multiplying by a thousand. It'd be 0.15 kilojoules. And so then you, uh, you know, it's a thousand joules per kilojoule. So the kilojoules cancel, you multiply by a thousand, you move your decimal place. Do you always take a kilo away, no matter what? Um, well, I'm showing you this table here where, where if you'll notice, I'm just trailing, trying to emphasize this. See, in this column for the entropy, those are joules per mole Kelvin, and the delta Gs and the delta Hs have kilojoules in them. And, and so in these cases, when you, um, sometimes you're dividing by R, the gas constant, and if you look up R in the book or in the notes, you'll see that it's 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Um, and if you're dividing, uh, say, Gibbs energy by R, the gives energies in kilojoules. So you're going to be off by a factor of, you know, an order of magnitude of three or, you know, a thousand if you don't pay attention to whether it's joules or kilojoules. So I'm just trying to emphasize for everybody, pay attention carefully to those joules versus kilojoules because that's a very common place to mess up. And so we can take this uh, definition of elements in their standard reference states being zero for their delta G of formation and we can make tables. So this is the third column in our our thermodynamics table. We're done with all of the thermodynamics tables. This is on the back page of your homework for this week. Uh, you can look up those values for the reactions that I have for you calculating. And, and notice here's nitrogen into gas. So it's delta H of formation is zero, it's delta G of formation is zero, but it's standard en entropy is not zero. So you have to pay attention to those standard entropies. Same down here for oxygen zero for the standard enthalpy, zero for the standard Gibbs energy, but not a zero value for the entropy because they have different reference points. Okay. Um, this, I went ahead and included this table in your thermodynamics table because this is for the next set of notes. And so you have it. So if you print that off, you can save it because we're going to use the next table uh, next week. So let's talk about non-standard temperatures and pressures. You know, most of our discussion on free energy to this point has involved 
the standard free energy change. I don't know if you really were paying attention, but you see that little degree symbol up in the superscript. That little zero superscript means all the species are at one bar at, or of partial pressure if they're a gaseous substance. Um, if they're an aqueous substance, it means they're one molar concentrations. So those are the standard conditions for the delta G of reaction. Okay. You can calculate delta G under non-standard conditions using the, the um, reaction quotient. So look at this reaction. We take the standard conditions, right, this delta G with the little superscript, and then we can correct it for a temperature change or other kinds of concentration changes using Q. So T is temperature in Kelvin. Of course, R is the gas constant. I went ahead and converted it to kilojoules, so that's why it's 0 .00831. And then Q is the reaction quotient, which is the concentration of the products over the reactants. We don't include solids, we don't include liquids. So same as we did for the equilibrium chapters. So it's aqueous concentrations and molarity. Uh, if it's a gas, we could use partial pressures. And that would correct our standard conditions to give us the Gibbs energy of that particular condition. And we're really interested in doing this for the equilibrium conditions. So let's look at equilibrium. Because equilibrium may not be at 25 C and in, in, in one atmosphere pressure. You know, another measure of this reaction spontaneity is the equilibrium constant. So for a forward reaction to be spontaneous, K must be greater than one. And why do we say that? It's because we want more products than reactants. So if K is greater than one, then we're moving towards products. Does everybody follow that from the equilibrium chapter? Okay. What about K being less than one? Then the reverse reaction is spontaneous. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Um, so how does this equilibrium constant relate to delta G of reaction? Well, we could set that equal to zero because the Gibbs energy at equilibrium is equal to zero and Q becomes K if we're at equilibrium. The reaction quotient becomes the, re the equilibrium constant. And so we put in these two conditions. We set this to zero because we're at equilibrium and we set this to K because we're at equilibrium. And then we have these fantastic relationships. We do a little bit of algebra and we get these two relationships that are just wonderful. If I know the reaction <coughs> equilibrium constant, I could calculate the standard delta G. So that's cool. And then if I have the standard delta G from the tables, I could calculate the equilibrium constant. And that's really the more useful term. So I can take that thermodynamic table, do products minus reactants and get my standard delta G. Then I could divide that number by RT, and then take that number, change the sign, and do the e to the x key, and I get the equilibrium constant. So that is so cool. That's where our equilibrium constants come from. So we could measure the concentrations of all the species, or we could measure their Gibbs energy. And if we measure the Gibbs energy, then we can calculate the equilibrium constant. And does RT come from ideal gas law? It's... Um, it's all related. It's all through Boltzmann's um, work on entropy and so on. But um, but yeah, this is but this is the the same. It's the same R but different units as the ideal gas constant. Yeah. So this is the R um, that's eight point three one four five um, joules per mole Kelvin. But but a joule. One joule is equal to, um, I'll, I'll have to put this weird number in here, one point, no, let's see, 100 and 1.325 liter atmospheres. Okay. And so if I convert this, if I convert this gas constant using this little trick here, then R becomes point. 08206 liters atmospheres per mole Kelvin. 
So it's the same constant as the gas constant, but it's just different units. Yeah, so instead of liters atmospheres, we have a joule, and so it's, a, it's about 100 times bigger. Okay. And so this relationship between delta G and K holds for all of those equilibrium constants we've discussed, KW and KA and KP and all of the different things, the solubility product constants. So we can use delta G values to calculate the equilibrium constants for any reaction. Um, in terms of adding reactions, if you add reactions together, you add the delta G's. It's just, to, just putting it in the notes just so you know. If a reaction is multiplied by a factor N, then the delta G is also multiplied by a factor of N. So, um, you know, these are, these are some, some important principles. So. And then if the reaction is reversed, then the sign of delta G is reversed. So let's, let's look at this pictorially, because I'm, I'm kind of a visual person. So if we have reactants here, and we, we find their Gibbs energy, so, uh, you know, we have like the delta, then we have the GF of all of the reactants, the Gibbs energy of formation for the reactants, and we have the, the G, the Gibbs energy of formation for all the products. We could take that delta G and calculate our, our K. And so what's going on is if the delta G is negative, then the forward reaction is, uh, is spontaneous. And this is kind of showing you how it rolls downhill. So essentially you can think of it as the reactants energetically rolling downhill and, you know, finding their way down to this spot at equilibrium. They don't go all the way to products because when you get too close to products, you're gone past the equilibrium constant, so they come back. So. And so this uh, K is equal to minus delta G over RT, and that minus delta G, is, this is a negative number, right? So this piece right here is less than zero. So you have the two negative signs cancel, so we have E to a positive number, which means that K is greater than one, right? It's e to a positive exponent, so that's going to be a positive number. And it's going to be greater than one, okay. Let's look at the opposite case. So we look at the delta G of formation for all the reactants. We look at delta G of formation for all the products. We see that it's uphill, so the delta G for that situation is greater than zero. And so, um, so when delta G, G of reaction is greater than zero, we know that the reverse reaction is spontaneous. So if we started out with the products, um, we would roll backwards. But even if we started out with pure reactants, we would roll forwards a little bit. Because, you know, we just do the ice table, right? We would have all reactants, zero products, a little bit of plus X over there, and then we figure out what the equilibrium concentrations would be. So because this number is greater than zero here, then we end up with an exponent to a negative number. And so E to some negative exponent is going to mean that K is less than one. K is not less than zero. It doesn't make a negative K. It just makes a K that's less than one. And then this is kind of a weird case. Might as well show when there's a delta G of zero. That means the reactants and products energetically are the same. And so this is the situation where you just go half and half. You've got half reactants, half products. Um, this is often the case for mixing because molecules really don't care about each other. There's no energetic difference between the products and the reactants. And so you end up with a 50-50 mixture. And so this would be, again, delta G of reaction is equal to zero. So it's going to be E to the zero, which means K is equal to one. So just having you read these equations, kind of like a paragraph, you know, what does it mean when this piece right here is zero? You work, sort of, you work it out of that equation and see what it does for K. Now, 
sometimes when we calculate reactions that have a really large and negative delta G, so let's look at this reaction here. So here I've got oxygen atom, not oxygen molecule. So oxygen atom has a huge delta G of formation, and nitrogen atom has a huge delta G of formation. And if I could combine them to make uh, nitric oxide, this is going to be a very spontaneous reaction. So that's delta G of reaction. Very, very spontaneous because it's negative and it's a big number. So what is K? Well, this is pretty easy. I could, here's my equation for K right here, okay? So it's E to the minus, and so don't, don't drop your negatives, right? It's E to the minus delta G, and delta G is negative. This is a real common mistake. Is they think that that minus sign in the equation is the minus sign they already have. And that's, that's a great place to screw up, okay? Um, and then you divide by, you gotta write your gas constant in kilojoules, if you wanna, if you wanna do that. So it's 0 0.0083145, and the temperature 298 Kelvin. So you put all this in the calculator and you end up with E to the positive 241.59. And so I type that into the TI-30 calculator and I get an error because the largest number it can calculate is 9.9 .9, and there's nine nines there at times 10 to the 99 because that's just as big as the display will go. So that's equal to E to the 230 and I'm at E to the 240. So if I hit the E key, I get an error because it just can't display the number. It's so big. And so you're kind of stuck. And this is where I say algebra is more powerful than your calculator. What we really would like is to write our equilibrium constant not in base E, but base 10. So I could compare it like 10 to the 50th or 10 to the 200. So how do I get out of base E and into base 10? Well, here's the, here's the way to do it. I've got base E to the Y, what is that at base 10 to the x? Okay, I can get to x by taking the log of 10 to the x. And then if I wanted to change that from base 10 to base e, that's the natural log or base e log of 10 to the 10 divided by the base e log of 10. And if you don't remember all this, that's fine. I just put it in here for your benefit. The bottom line is whenever I have this situation right here, x is equal to this, okay? So let's just show how that works. So I have k is equal to e to the positive 241.59, which is equal to 10 to this ratio, okay? So I just take that 241.59 and divide by 2.303, and it's 10 to the 105. Now, you probably catch yourself doing this. You got 10 to the 105 and you say, well, what's that number? You know, it's not gonna be exactly 105. It'll be 105 point something or other. And then if you hit the 10 to the X key, guess what? You get an error again, cause it's too big for your calculator to show. So um, every once in a while I'll do that and I'll catch myself. I'm like, you dummy, you're doing this because the calculator can't show it. And so quit trying to get it to show on your calculator. <laughs> So your calculator won't show 10 to the 105. It only goes up to 10 to the 99, but you can calculate what it is. It's close to 10 to the 105. So this has a huge um, equilibrium constant because we're taking a nitrogen atom and an oxygen atom and making a molecule out of it. Very, very spontaneous. Okay, let's do another example. Let's do the water one that we had earlier, two hydrogen molecules joining with oxygen to make water. So the Gibbs reaction, again, we have, uh, these are elements in their standard states. And so those have zero Gibbs energy of formation. And so it's just the two moles of water, which is negative 228.6. So again, very spontaneous, very negative and a large number. So what is K? This is the math associated with K. Now I'm at E to the 184, my TI-30 will do that. So I can hit E to the X on, on 184, I just couldn't do it on 241. 
And so I get 1.25 times 10 to the 80. Uh, let's check our little assumption with our base change thing. So, so this is 10 to the 184.43 divided by 2.303, and it's roughly 10 to the 80. So I, I get just the order of magnitude using the, the little base, um, the, the e to the power of 10, I mean, the, the, the base change in terms of my exponents, I get an approximation. I just get the power of 10, but that's enough for comparison's sake. Okay. Yeah, because that's the, the base conversion from from uh, base E to base 10. Yeah, it's it's this piece right here. So this um, this right here is the point two point three oh three. Okay. And so let's consider what we've seen. Heat flow is given by enthalpy. So that's the heat of the reaction. And disorder is, is measured using entropy. So we can see that you know this reaction created more disorder or less. And the Gibbs energy combines both of these. So it, it's able to say, yeah, you have an exothermic reaction, but you're decreasing order so much that there's certain temperatures in which that won't be spontaneous and other temperatures in which that will. And, and then we could use that Gibbs energy to produce the equilibrium constant, which is really cool because we just spent a whole three weeks studying equilibrium. And now here's the energetics of equilibrium. And so hopefully that's, um, uh, you know, kind of lights your imagination up. And uh, we're, we're done. We finished a little bit early. So y'all have a great weekend.